This is going to be a pretty experimental talk. Okay, I was asked to talk about, uh, about dynamics uh, and numerical methods for dynamics. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, take a cue from James and be as general as possible. But uh, I'm also going to do the opposite in, in certain ways. Uh, I'd like to show you a few things which are easy, which I think are very easy and very general and sort of fun to use, okay? Very nice toys that all of you can use in your work. And I'm going to try to, you know, prod you to actually try these things yourself, to, to code something up and to use it on your favorite system. And let's see how that works. Uh, so this is going to be mostly a numerics talk. Uh, and I like to say that numerics is a continuation of analytics by other means. Uh, some of you who are in the military maybe got that reference. I don't know about the rest of you. But uh, essentially, most theorists will tell you that they prefer to solve something analytically if they can, right? Like, if you can do it analytically, you probably should, because it's easier. OK, it might be more work to, I don't know, do, do more stuff on paper than you would by solving it on the machine. But you're going to get something that doesn't have as many problems. Okay, numerics is always a lot of hard work. It's always somewhat unreliable. And to get something out of it that isn't garbage is a lot harder than it is with analytics. With analytics, if you have the right equation, then you're pretty much OK. In numerics, you could have the right equation. And James showed an equation like this before, something like an inverse Laplace transform. And uh, if you try to do something with it numerically, you will get complete garbage. Unless you know what you're doing, you're not going to, to be able to, to get something sensical out of it. So uh, to do numerics, the first thing you want to do is get yourself familiarized with some tools. Okay, so this is not just pencil and paperwork. You have to actually use some tools. And there's good technology out there today, actually. This is a really nice period to do numerics. So who actually does this? Who? Uh, you know, codes in their research? OK. Who doesn't code in their research? OK. So that's not a projection operator. I see by uh, what's going on here. But OK, close to that. So most of you have done some sort of uh, coding, right? So which languages do you guys use? Or which software? Can I get? Fortran 77. OK. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone using something a little bit? Uh, Mathematica. Mathematica, okay. What's that? C++? Okay. Anything else? What's that? CUDA, okay. Using C++ or? C CUDA. C CUDA, okay. Julia, great. OK, so, so let me sort of draw a phase diagram here, OK? I, I will separate these things in a couple of ways. OK, the first way, which is sort of, uh, right, most of you have probably thought about, is that you have uh, low-level languages, which are fast and high-level languages, which are easy to use, OK? And people have varying opinions about uh, what you should use and why. But actually, both of these things are very useful, OK? So software industry has done some research on this. And development for anything which is not completely trivial using a high-level language is about five times as fast than using a low-level language, OK? So if you're doing a small project, and you don't want to spend time figuring out how to get the Fortran compiler to do something, which is a <laughs> serious amount of time, <laughs> you should do it in a high-level language. Okay? This actually saves you a lot of work, and a lot of things are easier and more flexible and so on. So you should start with this. Uh, if you want it to be fast, and if you want to run it on a supercomputer, you need to use a low-level language. Okay? People will tell you you can run Python on supercomputers, but they are basically lying. Okay? Uh, the other uh, axis I have here is sort of, uh, OK, I, I will do it like this. OK, think of the center tier 
as a sort of a boat, okay, or ship, moving forward. Okay, this is a nice ship. Okay, it's kind of old, it's steam powered, whatever, but it's working very well. Okay, then you have the top tier, which is also a boat, but it's like this rocket boat. Okay, it has uh, boosters here and uh, I don't know, lasers, <laughs> whatever. Okay, and the bottom tier okay, is a sinking boat. <laughs> okay, this is the Titanic. And uh, I'm sure you can uh, put most of the languages that we talked about on this, right? So we said uh, Fortran. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll talk, we can argue about it, but. Hmm? Certainly 77, but even Fortran uh, 90, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Here you would have, for instance, C++ and Python. Okay. Uh, now, in this tier, I'm going to put, uh, okay, so that I don't get sued if this video is online, <laughs> let's call it uh, Cat Thematica and Hat Lab. These are two hypothetical pieces of software. Okay. Okay, so Julia is interesting, right? So Julia is certainly in the spaceship category, right? It's very new. But is it low level or high level? It's high level. Okay, so it's high level, but it's sort of like leaning towards the low level side, right? It's supposed to be efficient. So this is something nice about some of these new languages. Okay, and I could also put something like, okay, it might not be new, but it is somewhat novel, Haskell, something like that, okay? So some of these newer languages are somewhere in between high level and but low level. Haskell is extremely old, no? Haskell is quite old, but it's actually sort of actively being developed and uh, it has new features, new ideas all the time. Then again, you should not use it, but okay, <laughs> we'll get to that in a, in a minute. And uh, I don't think anyone is making so much new low level stuff unless it's hardware level stuff. So CUDA is, for instance, something like this, right? Or uh, there's this uh, uh, OpenCL, I think this is called. Okay, this is sort of uh, stuff to take advantage of new hardware, and it can be useful. But okay, so uh, you can guess from this diagram that I probably don't want you to be here. Okay, uh, so so let's talk about why. Okay, if you're using Fortran or I don't know, COBOL or whatever, if you've basically, enough, what? If it is enough for task? Uh, anything is enough. You can do anything in assembler, okay? It's a question of whether it's worth the huge amount of effort you will spend doing this. Okay, so if you have a big <coughs> code base in Fortran 77 that you have to maintain and that someone has spent many years on, then it might be worthwhile doing it. But you shouldn't start a new project in this because you're missing out on something like 30 or 40 years Okay, of work from computer science and the software industry. And all this new technology, you, you are just not getting it. And a lot of that technology has to do with software engineering and with writing bigger projects. So if you're writing a, you know, a 10 line code, which in Fortran is a 100 line code, but never mind, then it might be okay to do this. But if you're gonna get it a little bigger, then this is going to become a nightmare, okay? So this is something that should be avoided. There used to be an excuse that this is fast, okay, but uh, obviously, since this is not very popular outside certain fields of science, the effort that goes into optimizing these compilers these days is nowhere near what goes into C++, for instance. So you don't get that advantage anymore. Uh, and another big disadvantage, which is also true for these guys, is that it's domain specific. Okay, so professional programmers do not use Fortran. Okay, this is not a thing that they are aware of even. Maybe they heard of it because it was in some movie about NASA recently, right? But uh, they don't work with it. 
And that means that when you're looking for answers in Fortran and you go to these nice websites with answers about code questions, uh, either you will not find answers or you will find very bad answers from people who are not good programmers. If you look for answers in Python or in C++, which are the two most popular languages in the world, you're going to get very good, uh, right, both a high quantity of answers, but also a good quality of answers. And you will actually learn something from this. So as a programmer, which again is a secondary skill for you as a, science, as a scientist, but it's an important skill, you're going to get better by reading what people do in C++ and Python. You're not going to get better. You're going to get worse by reading what they do in Fortran. And uh, you know, nothing is worse than HATLAB, OK? So, so you know, this is about culture, in a way. Okay, this culture is more modern and it's just better. Okay, it's, it's, it's substantially better. These things are proprietary. Okay, they cost money, usually not to you, but to your university. Sometimes you will uh, uh, be, uh, I don't know, uh, urged to steal them, okay, which I don't think is something you should do. Uh, and in practice, they do not have advantages over Python. Okay, they can do everything that Python can do, probably, possibly a little less. There is absolutely nothing that they can do better. Yes? There is one thing that Mathematics can do which none of them can, mm -hmm. which is symbolic computations. No, that's not true. There's, there's SIMP, which is excellent. And unlike Mathematica, you have access to the engine. So a lot of new research in symbolic algebra goes there before it goes into Cathematica. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so. So everything can be done here, OK? This is really quite nice. If you look at the websites of these guys, you can smell desperation, OK? You'll see how do they tell you that you should use their products. They will tell you that they are more user friendly, OK? They will tell you that they are easier to learn, OK? This is something that's very important for software that you're going to use for three minutes and then throw away, like an app on your cell phone, OK? Uh, it's not important for software that you're going to be using over years. It affects the experience during the first, I don't know, three weeks of your usage of the app. And then, you know, basically, right, Vim is great software, but one of the most common searches on uh, Stack Exchange is how do I exit Vim? Yeah. Okay, the answer is very intuitive. It's either shift ZZ or uh, uh, colon Q exclamation mark. I don't see why that's so difficult, but yeah, obviously this is not intuitive at first. After a few weeks of using that thing, uh, it will seem fine, okay? It doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so, so you should really abandon this. Uh, the point where it becomes technically important is when you're doing calculations on clusters. Okay, so some clusters will support this. There is some support for parallelization on these things, but it's not good. It usually costs more money and you should just avoid it altogether, okay? It's not worth it. Just switch to this. So again, if you have some code base, fine, but do not start something new in this. Just move to this. Uh, you will have a better experience. Is there almost. a spaceship replacement for those? For, uh, for these guys? Yes. Python. Okay, so what's, what needs to be replaced in these guys is the graphical user interface. Okay. I will, I'll say that in a moment, okay? And someone already sort of said the answer, but uh, yeah. So, uh, so the GUI in these things is quite good, the graphical user interface. And nowadays, Python has something called Jupyter, uh, which is very rapidly evolving, uh, which is actually not just for Python, it's for a lot of languages. You can also use it in Julia or whatever. And uh, this is really sort of eating into the last bits of this. And this thing is, you know, because it's now the most popular language in the world, it's evolving rapidly, and it's going to have versions which are spaceship ver versions, which are faster. There are already like alternative implementations of Python, which are somewhat faster. There's Python with uh, uh, just-in-time compilation and things like this. Okay, so, so I th th that's it about these guys. Now, why am I not encouraging you so much to explore these guys? Okay, so these things are very good for certain applications. Okay, like uh, the graphics card stuff is great if you're doing SIMD. Okay, single instruction, multiple data. So for very specific applications, you can really get a lot out of them. 
it involves serious technical know-how. Okay, it is not easy to get something out of these that you couldn't get in a fraction of the effort from a CPU. So if you know what you're doing, if you have the technical skills and the interest in going into this, fine. But it shouldn't be the first thing you, you learn and you shouldn't go into it unless you're really sure you need to. Okay? Essentially, it's saving money. Okay? Because you can more cheaply do something on a GPU than you could on a CPU in some very special cases. But there's nothing you have to do on it. Uh, and I don't think there's much else new in the low-level world. Okay? In the high-level stuff, or the you know, high-level that sort of works like low-level, Haskell is a great language to learn sort of intellectually. Okay? Uh, who here has tried functional programming? Two people, yeah. It's very cool, right? So if you do the MIT course, even if you've been programming for many years, you're probably going to have... Where is the place for Lisp in this table? Uh, where is the place for Lisp? I would say here. <laughs> Does anyone use Lisp to do anything? Hmm? Uh, it, it is a Zamorphic to Haskell. That's true, yeah, but it's old and Haskell is new and uh, Haskell is somewhat better than Lisp these days, right? The compiler gets maintained, it gets optimized, things like this. Lisp, no. Okay. Uh, so, so this is really nice, okay? This will sort of make you a better programmer, but you're not going to do anything real in it, okay? Nobody does that. It's very difficult to use. Uh, it'll make your programming in other languages somewhat, somewhat better. Okay, so it's a nice little summer project to try to do something small in Haskell, but I wouldn't recommend it as a main language for anyone, basically. Julia is interesting, okay? So Julia has a syntax which is sort of uh, CatLab-like, okay? It's somewhere between CatLab and Python, okay? It's new, it's modern, and it's fast. It has a lot of ideas that allow you to write code which is mostly high level, but actually gets compiled uh, without you having to worry about all these C++ or Fortran details like types. It does a lot of that automatically. Okay, given that, okay, this has a lot of potential. Okay, but given that, there are two big problems. A, it's harder to use than Python. Okay, and it's not as fast as C++. Okay, in practice, in order to get fast stuff out of Julia, except in the cases that they show you on their website, and I've done this, you have to understand Julia quite deeply. Okay, and you, have, you end up calling C functions and things like this. And Julia isn't something Python-based, it's like... No, it's not Python-based, it's, it's a new project. And it makes a binary. Yes, it, it gets compiled, okay? It's a, uh, it's a whole new language, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is specific for that, for that scenario, okay? It wants to be sort of like Python in terms of the syntax, it wants to be a dynamic language, we don't have to worry about the details but it wants to be fast like C++, okay? And it's designed in a particular way that allows them to do that, but it doesn't quite work, okay? It's a very nice idea. It doesn't always work. If you try to do it, you will see that you will, uh, unless you're doing something very special or you know exactly what you're doing, you're not going to get code that's really fast. And then the work in order to get a high level language to be efficient is usually not worth it unless you're changing only a small part of the code. So you can also work with Python and add Cython, okay, you guys know this. Okay, there's something called Cython, which you can compile a very small part of a Python code into a C code and uh, use that. Or you can call a particular C function from within Python. So if you can take a small part of your application and only optimize that, then these things are worth it. But otherwise, uh, if you have a big application with a lot of logic written in a high level language, if it doesn't optimize it by itself, uh, you're gonna have to rewrite the thing in C++ anyway. Speaking about Python, it's yeah. I haven't used Python a lot, but as far as I understand, uh, calling C libraries from Python is a common thing. So yeah, that's right. So basically, you don't even care about Python's uh, speed because you basically Well, it, C. it depends on what you're doing, right? So if you are using numerical algebra libraries, if this is 90% of what you're doing, then essentially this is like doing them in uh, MATLAB, right? Because so it does it by, by 
because actually it's calling some Fortran 77 library that does it, okay? And that was written over years to be very optimal. Okay, now it's probably not Fortran anymore. But this is, right, you use a library that's written by Intel or by, uh, by AMD, depending on which processor you're using, or at Cray if you're on a supercomputer, and it is optimized for that particular hardware to do it best. Okay, so this is going to be faster than doing it on this. Okay, if you do it on C, you're going to call the same library and it's going to be exactly the same. The point where Python is slow is if you have logic in Python. Okay, Python is bad with things like fast, small loops, things like this. And again, if you don't understand what's behind that, you're going to have a hard problem getting it to be fast. Okay, and it's probably not worth it. It's probably worth just switching to this. Because anything you do in C++, in C, right? Maybe C, right? You, you can maybe also put C here, okay? And CC. But anything, anything you do in C++ is going to be much more efficient than something you do in Python. It may not be optimal, right? You still have to know how to program, but uh, at least it's going to compile well. Okay, so again, Julia is nice, okay? This is something from the future, okay? But uh, it doesn't quite work. It may be abandoned two years from now, and then you'll have a code, and no one's going to update that compiler, okay? Nobody knows if this is going to stick around. Python, you know, it's in the middle category. It's been around for 20 or 30 years or something. Okay, it's here to stay for the foreseeable future. And it has the same problem as these guys that it's very domain specific. Okay, so Julia is meant for scientists, okay, or for people doing data science. Okay, this, is, uh, uh, this means that not as many people are going to use it, not as many professional people are going to use it as people who use these guys. Okay, so you're never going to get as good a database of answers, and it's going to be harder to get better in the language. Okay, so, you know, given all that, I urge you to choose something in this middle tier when you can. I urge you to think when you're doing a project whether you can be on the right side of this tier or whether you need to be on the left side. Okay, you don't want to go here unless you need to. Okay, it's actually a good practice to write a slow code in Python and then convert it to C++. Okay, this is something that I do often and this is something that they do in, uh, in software companies. Okay, it's called rapid prototyping. You work out all your logic in an easy language and then you go to a hard language to get efficient code. Uh, so by yeah. by hands? Uh, well, automatic where you can, but by hand where you must. That's the... Okay, so essentially to write good code, you will have to rewrite at least most of it. Okay, okay so that's just a little bit of, uh, you know, general numeric stuff. Okay, is there something in the right corner that's like pure, not like Julian Haskell in that bubble? But like here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think that these are not stuff that you should be interested in, right? You can, uh, I, I don't know, elk. So there are new languages coming out. What is this? This is something that compiles into JavaScript, right? I, I don't want this. This is for web developers. So new languages come out all the time. Uh, most of them are not that interesting. Okay, there's no real good reason to come up with, with good languages all the time. Sometimes there's a new concept, like in Julia. Okay, it's not that new. The implementation is new, maybe. There are some new ideas, but you shouldn't just, uh, you know, change languages every year or two. Okay, so that, that's, that's what I have to say about uh, numerical tools. Now, let's talk a little bit more about science. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to tell you much about, about physics or science itself. I'm going to talk about methods. So the way that I'll structure this is that I'm going to talk about uh, essentially three sets of things, okay, uh, yeah, I don't remember how I structured it, yeah, okay, well, two sets of things really, there'll be, there'll be an introduction, then we'll do, uh, Wave function methods. Then we'll talk about Green's function methods. 
Okay, and these are sort of broad categories of methods that you have for the quantum many body problem. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the methods, of course, right? This is, I think, ambitious enough for, uh, you know, a few hours. But uh, what I'd like to do is give you a general idea, uh, which I'm not sure everyone has, but we'll see about what the many body problem is, right? Why it exists, why it's difficult, and so on. And then sort of like two main ways that we have had for attacking it. Okay, and in each one of these, I'm going to be very practical. I'm going to give you tools. I'm going to show you code, okay? Give you code that actually does things. Okay, and again, what I would like you to do is just take this code and run it on your favorite model and get something out of it, okay? This will be the homework. Okay, so... Okay, so let's, let's begin about, begin with the n-body problem versus the many-body problem. Okay, you guys know this terminology? So n-body is the classical problem, okay, and we know from uh, Poincaré from long ago that the three-body problem is unsolvable. What does it mean that it's unsolvable? It's unsolvable in general analytically, okay? That doesn't mean that you can't solve it on a computer, you can solve it very easily on a computer. Whereas the many-body problem is the quantum problem, and that is a more difficult problem, okay? It's intrinsically more difficult than the classical n-body problem. So why is that? Okay, uh, first we can just talk about the amount of data that goes into it. Okay, so for a classical method, if I just want to write the state of my system, okay, so I have a system with uh, n particles, okay, in uh, d dimensions. Okay, so to write the state of my system, I have to know the locations and momenta of all the particles, and then I can solve Newton's equations or Hamilton's equations or whatever, and know what the system will be doing in the future. Okay, if I'm talking about time propagation, then that's, that's all I have to do. I have the state now, and I have to tell you what it's going to do a moment from now. Okay, so the amount of data that I have to do here is two times the dimension times the number of particles, just linear. What happens in the quantum case? It's d to the power of n. Hmm? d to the power of n, 2 power dm. Okay. Why? Well, first of all, okay, let, let's, wh why is it even a problem, right? So, you know, here I solve Newton's equations, here I solve Schrodinger's equation. So the object that I have to deal with is a wave function. How much information is in the wave function? In principle, it's infinite, right? So, you know, to begin with, it's infinity. Okay, but this is uh, not a practical answer, right? Uh, because right, if, if this were really true, we couldn't do much, right? So if we're doing something on a computer, then we can uh, discretize or something like that. So we have a wave function. Okay, it's a function of, uh, say, x. This contains infinite information, but we can sample it at some number of points. Okay, that's m distinct points. And we can work with that. And if m is large enough and it covers a wide enough regime, then we're going to get an answer which is as close as we want to the correct answer. Okay, and this is true for any sort of work with functions. This is not specific to quantum mechanics. So what we can say, right, this is sort of equivalent to saying I'm expanding in a basis. Okay, I have a basis of wave functions. They can be delta functions or they can be orbitals in chemistry. And I expand in this basis. And then if I take my wave function to be... So, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't worry about symmetries or anything like that for now. Okay, but I have some set of coefficients, okay, n1 to n, n, where big N is the number of particles. And then I have uh, a set of orbitals, right, 
So I have phi of n1. phi of n, n. Okay, and this wave function is a function of all the coordinates. And I can write, I can expand any basis, any wave function in a basis like this, assuming I have enough orbitals in my basis to span the space of interesting, right, energetically interesting, let's say, wave functions. So if I'm in some low energy limit, I'll need to go high enough in energy in order to cover what I need. Okay. So what is the size of this? Each one of these things is a complex number, right? And the number, right, I have to sum over all these indices, right? So I have to count how many I have here. So for each one of these indices, I can be in any of the uh, big M orbitals. So I have something like M to the number of electrons, OK? So this is the sort of the scaling of a quantum many-body problem with the number of uh, particles, where in principle m is, infin is infinite, but uh, in practice we can always take a finite m, or at least for most problems that we're interested in, we can take a finite m. And this exponent is why it's difficult. Uh, of course, it's also why it's interesting, right? This is why you want to have quantum computers. OK, so let's do some, right, just a bit of numerical examples. OK, suppose I want to talk about a system of spins. So each one of these guys can just be in an up or down state. So in that case, big M is 2. OK, so I have 2 to the n uh, possible states in my system. Uh, so you know, if I have 10 spins, right, Geometry doesn't matter here. Then I have just a thousand states, and this is uh, uh, not so bad, right? For a classical system, I would have on the order of, uh, I don't know, 60 states, right? But uh, still, this doesn't kill me. I can easily diagonalize a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. If I go to 20 spins, right, then my wave function begins to be about a, a few megabytes in size. Okay, so I can keep it in computer memory. But then uh, operating on it starts to become expensive. Okay, but well, let's let's keep going like this. Uh, so two to the thirty is gigabytes. Okay, gigabytes you can still keep in a computer's memory. Two to the forty you're going to need a cluster. Two to the fifty you have to go to uh, you know these big distributed memory applications on a supercomputer, and that's about as far as you can go with pure brute force. Okay, these days let's say. So. When we talk about quantum supremacy in the quantum computing context, okay, what this means is that you know, with the best classical hardware, we can do 50 spins uh, in brute force. Uh, that doesn't mean that this is what we can do for physical systems. Okay? That means that that's what we can do using brute force in a completely general way. Now, having a quantum computer with 50 spins, and I think there's one with like 2,000 spins now, also doesn't mean that it's equivalent to that thing. Because it matters uh, what the coherence time is, how these spins are connected to each other, how many operations you can do before coherence dies out, and all these things. Because at the end of the day, all those quantum computers are physical systems. So it may be that simulating them is now a lot easier than it would be if they were, let's say, real quantum computers. Okay. Uh, so this is just data. Okay, we can also talk about computation. Okay, and again, classical systems are very easy. Okay, so if you just have two body interactions, okay, then you have to, while you're solving Newton's equations, you have to calculate the interactions between every pair of particles, right? So you're going to have something that scales like the number of particles squared, right? Then you have to do that for each particle. So classical things scale like n to the third. Okay, and this is also true for uh, not just for systems of particles, but you get scaling, right, which is like the volume of the system, say something like that, or 
right? Like the number of particles, the number of data points in the system, also for problems with turbulence, all sorts of the, right, the more difficult quantum problems. And then often you can make approximations, right? So if you're looking at stars in a galaxy, you can do multiple expansions and reduce this uh, from n to the third to n squared, or even make it linear in some cases. And we can simulate a billion stars, uh, uh, even with general relativity. Uh, and two galaxies uh, collapsing, right? This is a simulation that can be done. But we can't do 10 electrons in a molecule or something, right? OK, and the reason we can't do that for quantum systems is that this is the wave function. But if you actually need to write a Hamiltonian, then the Hamiltonian is like the wave function squared, right? So if you actually need to write the full Hamiltonian, this is like m to 2n. And then, you know, yes? Can I ask a question about class concentration? Yeah. When you say that you can simulate 1 billion stars, you, you, you certainly don't mean that you can solve newton equations for them, right? Uh, well, it you can't find u to the cows, you can't find exact coordinates. So, so you specify what you, want, what you mean by solving. solving yeah, solve. that's right. So, so okay, a billion stars you cannot do exactly, okay? You have to make approximations. Yeah, I mean, and you can uh, update, uh, calculate. Yeah, so you can calculate, uh, okay, this is a general question about chaos, right? You could ask this about any classical simulation, right? Any nonlinear system, can you actually simulate it? And you could say that no, eventually at long times, my numerical errors will grow up exponentially, and uh, I can't do it reliably. Okay, but then there's the question of uh, you know what happens in in the real world. Okay, there is some noise that you're not taking into account in your theory, and you have to separate between things which are robust to tiny amounts of noise or or to tiny uh, changes in your initial condition, and things which are not. So things of the first kind you can get. Okay, statistical properties. Uh, Classical mm -hmm. chaos is, in a sense, something which is left from quantum complexity uh, in, in, in a classical world. Yeah. So that's, that's be related. Yeah, so I, 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 I don't know. Uh, this is an active field of research, and I'm not uh, an expert on it. Abanin is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this is still open to some interpretation. Uh, people have said for years that there's no such thing as quantum chaos, right? Because your equations are linear, so you cannot have chaos. But certainly you have effects which have to do with chaos in quantum mechanics. And now you can look at uh, some equivalent of Lyapunov exponents, and you can do Loschmidt echo. People do this experimentally. And there are all sorts of things that you can do to... Uh, but the question is whether you can calculate, right, something that can be uh, reproduced in an experiment. And for classical mechanics, for all practical purposes, you can. For quantum, it's very difficult. You can only do it in very few cases. OK. Uh, so OK, so this is, this is a little bit uh, you know, uh, too much, right? Because usually the many body Hamiltonians are sparse. We'll look at this. So maybe you can do it in m to the n. But if you really do need m to the 2n, then you realize that uh, you know, at uh, something like 30 electrons, you run out of memory in the world. So it's uh, 30 spins, sorry. So this is a big limitation, actually. And uh, you know, I, I did a bit of a calculation, right? So there's the top computer in the world now. There's this list of. Uh, top 400, which tells you which are the uh, fastest supercomputers in the world. So China was ahead of the list until recently, and now it's the US again. Uh, and they have a machine called Summit that can do 10 to the 18 uh, floating point operations per second, which is sort of mind blowing, I think. But uh, uh, that's right, if you work it out, then that means that if you want to simulate, right, fully honestly, with no approximations, right, uh, as in at the level of a quantum computer, 60 spins, okay, and do a time step, 
So on that machine, you can do one time step per second. Okay. So what does what does this tell us? Okay, let's let's say that's good enough. Okay, let's say that at that point you don't want to build quantum computers. Uh, we have Moore's law for classical computers, right? You guys have heard of this, right? So every year and a half, uh, for the same cost, you get twice the performance out of classical uh, computers. And uh, you know there are arguments about whether this is still alive or not, right? That, in practice, for supercomputers, it, it seems to be still alive. Uh, we don't know if it'll be alive forever or, or whatever. But if we, you know, sort of innocently extrapolate by that exponent the way that economists do, we assume that things can grow exponentially forever, then that means every year and a half we can add one spin. Okay? So if the state of the art now is 60 spins, then right three years from now it'll be 62 spins. Okay, so we can just using standard engineering uh, add one spin per year. We have a linear rate of growth of our ability to simulate quantum systems. Uh, so it used to be that for quantum computers, right, what, why is it that nobody was even interested in them when they were first proposed? Or, well, okay, some people were interested, but they weren't such a big deal. Uh, because we had the idea that as we make the computer bigger, you need to make the signal to noise ratio exponentially smaller. Okay, and that in practice cannot be done, right? There, there are very real limitations to that. But now we understand quantum error correction codes and we think that we can make it, uh, we, as we grow our computer, we need to make the signal noi to noise ratio polynomially smaller. Okay, it's not known what the polynomial power is. Okay, they hope it's a small power. But uh, right, uh, you, you can see from the previous discussion that if it's sublinear, okay, then eventually quantum computers will catch up to classical computers. Okay, so now now this is sort of the question of whether that power is sublinear, and this is going to be an engineering question. Okay. Uh, well, okay, it's some of it is basically a computer science question, but uh, we don't know yet, uh, and we're certainly in a, a time where those questions are you know, hopefully going to be answered soon. Okay. Uh, you're the chairman. Okay, so yeah, so, okay, so let's do a break now. When we try to do, to simulate dynamics or, you know, even find a ground state of some many-body Hamiltonian, anything that we do in a, theoretical physics or chemistry or anything like that, where we face the quantum anybody problem, uh, we are eventually limited by this exponent if we try to do things in brute force, if we try to solve everything exactly. Okay, so uh, what do we actually do? Uh, I mean, there's not so much that you can do, right? You, you can't just go ahead and solve this. So you try to come up with uh, either models where you can uh, do things, okay? where you can scale up and, and look at large systems if that's what you're interested in, or you look at small systems, and sometimes you can learn enough from small systems, or you look at methods which allow you to do something approximate, okay, but hopefully controlled, where you can learn something about the physics of a system even though you cannot fully solve it. Okay, and this is essentially, right, uh, in, in, in one sentence, everything that we do in theoretical physics, right? This is something like this. Uh, so we have to search under these flashlights and we have to hopefully find new flashlights. And there are systems where we can do quite a bit. So one kind is non-interacting systems. Okay, for non-interacting quantum systems, we can essentially do whatever we want. And uh, uh, I'm going to discuss that a little bit because that's one of the easiest things you can do and actually there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can do with them that's cool uh, other kinds of systems where we have something we can do are 1d systems so you know for you know the low energy of 1d systems we have quite a bit of theory and we also have methods like uh, DMRG uh, right density matrix renormalization group matrix product states which work well for 1d gapped systems and a little bit beyond that and uh, we have systems which are, right, which I, 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 some people call impurity models, 
where you have a small interacting part of the system, but it's coupled to a large non-interacting system. Okay, and for those systems, we have quite a few results and methods, numerical methods that allow us to progress pretty far. Uh, we have this uh, infinite dimensional limit uh, that uh, you've heard about uh, dynamical mean field theory. And we have a few other cases like that. But really, it's quite sparse. Okay, so we have a small number of cases where we can look well. Beyond that, we, we do some sort of mean field theory, we do some sort of uh, strong coupling expansion that is essentially a mean field theory in a dual basis or something like that. Uh, we just try to do our best. And it's a big problem, okay, which is also why uh, people talk about quantum simulators and using uh, ultra cold atoms or something like that to simulate interesting systems. So I want to introduce a little bit of formalism, okay? Uh, and uh, right, we, we, this should be familiar to every, everyone, so this is not something uh, uh, that should be new to you. Uh, so suppose we have a vacuum state, okay? A state with no particles in it, okay? And we have some set of orbitals, right? Okay? which are labeled from 1 to a big M, as I said before. Then I can define an operator, A dagger M, in such a way that it acts on the vacuum states and puts a particle in state M, okay, in a orbital M. This defines the set of single particle states. Okay, for big M orbitals, there are big M single particle states. Okay, that's a basis that spans everything else I could uh, have. And then I have two particle states, right? So I can define a uh, stay state like this. One, two as a dagger one, a dagger two times zero. Okay, now I have to think about uh, my particle statistics at this point. And this is where uh, these second quantization operators are even useful. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about fermion operators from now on. Okay, so everything will be fermions, just to keep it simple. And then this is minus a dagger 2, a dagger 1, 0. Okay, so this is important, right? If I have this, then I have fermion statistics. And the order at which I apply these particles to the vacuum state to construct my states matters. Okay, I will have all the properties that fermions should have if I just have a dagger m, a m equal uh, a n. Uh, it's called m prime equals delta m, m prime, and all other commutators should be zero. Okay, so. Given this, I can construct a nice set of uh, basis functions that sums up, that, that covers the whole state here, right? And again, the number of, of states in this basis is going to eventually be uh, big M, right, to the power of big M, which is the number of particles I have. Or, uh, okay, so, something to that order, okay? A very large number of states is going to be... Uh, so, so I could work in that full many-body state, uh, space, and solve problems. But I would generally like to avoid that because it's a huge space. Okay. So let's talk about a few models. And I'm going to distinguish between uh, interacting and non-interacting models. And I'm going to do this in a very abstract way, okay? This is going to be a non-interacting Hamiltonian, or actually, okay, so call this H0. And this is a sum over M, M prime, of a matrix H, small h, M, M prime, times A dagger M, A, M prime. 
Okay, so this Hamiltonian is quadratic in the fermionic second quantization operators. This is called, this is what I call a non-interacting system. Okay, now words like interacting, correlated, things like that, they're very loaded. Okay, as James said, there are no two people who will agree on what a strongly correlated system is. But uh, when you talk about, in many body theory, about a non-interacting system, this is a non-interacting system. Okay, if you're in quantum optics, then, uh, you know, a system which has a level coupled to some other levels is interacting because it's interacting with these other levels. But if that interact interaction is linear, quadratic, and second quantization operators, then I'm going to call it a non-interacting system. Okay, this is just the terminology, and it'll be clear why because again, these these systems are very easy to solve. Okay, so. Uh, So let's look at an example, and I'm going to reuse this example all the time, a 1D chain. Okay, so I can write a Hamiltonian that looks like this. Is that a rooster? Ah, oh, there are chickens there. Cool. Okay. So T. A dagger I, A I plus one, plus Hermitian conjugate. Okay, and I can maybe add a term like this, epsilon, A dagger I, A I. Okay, so first of all, you can see that I can extract from this uh, my matrix small h. Okay, this matrix is going to look like this along the diagonals. It has epsilon, and at f1 from the diagonal, it's going to have t's. Okay. And everything else is a zero. Okay, so it's a banded matrix, tridiagonal matrix. So this can be diagonalized actually analytically for a 1D chain, right? You get a dispersion relation which is like a cosine, and you've probably done this, uh, you know, when you learned about tight binding in your uh, undergraduate studies. Uh, but in general, uh, right, I, I could add other elements here. And any elements I add, I could take this matrix and diagonalize it on a computer. And I could get a set of single particle orbitals. Okay. Those orbitals, each one of these orbitals has a single particle energy. And if I work in that basis, then I can find all the eigenstates of the many body Hamiltonian. Okay, the eigenstates of the many-body Hamiltonian are when you put particles in those single particle orbitals. Okay, so essentially that problem uh, maps onto a single particle problem, which can be solved at classical cost. Okay, what is classical cost? This is uh, diagonalizing a matrix, which is at worst like the size of the system to uh, cubed. Okay, so, so far so good. That's a non-interacting system. So what do I mean by interactions? Any non-quadratic term is an interaction. Okay, so I could have something like this. This will be same as the Hubbard interaction that James was talking about. Okay, I'll write something similar so it fits onto the same model. I, I should call this a J, maybe, okay? Okay, so what is this? This is an interaction between an electron on site I and an electron on the next site. 
So every electron interacts with the next site on the chain. OK, so this is another 1D model, but this model is interacting. OK, uh, is it integrable? Maybe, right? This, this is not relevant to the conversation. OK, so again, the distinction between interacting and non-interacting should be very clear here. And what I want to do now is actually uh, talk about the things we can do with non-interacting systems. Uh, but I want to give this uh, quantum information spin. Okay, so what I want to talk about is how we can take a system like this and use it to realize a qubit. Okay, and then uh, we'll see that we can do that very easily. But then we'll look at what happens when it tries to realize more than one qubit using it. And we'll see that then uh, things break down. And what I want to convince you of is that actually to have an interesting system with more than one qubit, we need to have interactions in the system. Okay, so interactions are sort of a crucial component of making quantum information uh, non-trivial or non-classical. Let's start with a system that has just one site but two spins. Okay, so I'm going to write my non-interacting Hamiltonian in a slightly different way. Sum over sigma, sigma are spins of A dagger site 1 spin sigma, A site 1 spin sigma. Okay, sigma will be either up or down. Okay, so in total, right, the Hilbert space of this Hamiltonian is spanned by how many states? Four. Four, right? So let's write them out. Okay, I have the unoccupied state. I have the up state. I have the down state, and I have this state, okay? So this is a zero particle state. These two are one particle states. This is a two particle state. If I want to use the physical spin of this site in order to realize a qubit, right, then I'm probably interested in these guys, okay? I don't have to use these guys. I can make any choice I want, but let's try to use the physical spin, right, the up-down state of the electron to realize a qubit. So that means that I want to extract this subspace out, okay? Now, I, I can write this in a slightly more detailed way, like this, okay? Nothing, nothing, up, nothing, down, nothing, and up, down. Oh, sorry, no, okay, no, sorry, this is, yeah, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Forget that. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to extract these two states. Uh, and in principle, I can do that. I can say, okay, let's, let's put my wave function in a one electron state. Okay, A up plus B down. How do I do that? I take my system, I put one electron in it, and I isolate it from the universe, right? So obviously, right, it won't create or destroy an electron, so it's going to stay in this subspace. And now I can uh, play around with it. I can try to do computations. So one thing I might like to do is to apply a quantum gate, right? So let's see how we can realize a quantum gate. And again, I'm using the word realize. Okay, what I mean by that is that, okay, I want to apply the operation uh, uh, Z, right? The Z gate to the system or something like that. But in order to do that to a physical system, right, everything I can do to a system is just let it evolve in time according to some Hamiltonian. Okay, this is what systems do in the real world. There's a Hamiltonian, they evolve in time with respect to it. Maybe I can do measurements once in a while, but uh, that's, that's sort of a different thing. If I want unitaries, then I have to do time evolution. So let's see if we can work out a Hamiltonian that will do something like that. Okay, so I'm going to write a Hamiltonian 
right, I'm going to write this small h matrix in the following form. Right? It's a function of sigma and sigma prime. And it's going to have to be time dependent. OK, up to some time t, it's going to be this matrix. And after that, it's going to be just 0. OK? So now I can actually uh, see how my system will evolve in time. OK, so wh what's my Hamiltonian going to do? It's going to, uh, for times less than t, it's going to modify the down state. Okay? And it's going to give it a phase which is e to i uh, to minus i alpha times the time. It's going to do that until time big T. And then it's, after that, my Hamiltonian is zero. So my system is not moving anymore. So, Psi at times which are greater than t is going to be just a up plus e to minus i alpha big T b down. OK, so alpha is a parameter. I'm free to play with it. t is a parameter, and I'm free to play with it. So all I have to do is choose alpha t equals, uh, say, pi, right? And then this is going to be a up minus b down. And we have a quantum gate. OK, it's a phase gate in general. I've chosen a particular phase. So again, we've realized a quantum gate using time evolution. And uh, you can right, sort of work this out yourself, right? As a simple exercise, find that you can realize any single qubit quantum gate on the system. OK, so if we can realize this simple non-interacting system and make sure that it only has one electron in it, we have a qubit. OK, so we have won the race for quantum computing. OK, now let's see what happens when we try to do this with two qubits. OK, so is everyone with me so far? OK. OK, so I'm going to repeat what we just did, but for two qubit states, uh, for two sites. OK, so the states I have are the zero electron state. And then I have, uh, let's put it here. two electron states, but I have a bunch of two electron states. I have up, 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 down, down, up, and the down, down. Okay. And then I have one electron states. So I can have up, nothing, nothing, up. Down, nothing, nothing down. Okay. Sorry? Okay, so which ones? Yeah. Uh, Yes, okay, that's right. Yeah, so uh, actually, yeah. So what, what I should add here are something like this, right? Let, let's use this notation. Okay, these are also two electron states. Okay, these are all one electron states. Okay, I did it in a weird order, but never mind. And I also have three and four electron states, which I won't write. Okay. Now, uh, I have two sites. Each one has a spin, right? If I want to have two qubits, then I just need four states. 
right? So I have actually too many states here, which I guess is fine, right? I, I, can, I can work with these guys. Okay, so this is a manifold of one electron states that, that seems to more or less work. Okay, it has all the states I want. Uh, it has four states, so I can sort of try and map these onto four qubit states. Okay. Uh, and again, this, right, I have to choose a computational basis and map this onto it, but uh, yeah, right, it, it's perfectly possible to do this. Okay, so the question now is whether I'm actually able to, uh, uh, okay, wh whether I'm able to apply a two qubit quantum gate to this problem. Okay. So certainly I can in general, but a more interesting question is whether I can do it using only non-interacting physics. No, you, you need a term that transfers the electron from one side to another. That's right. Okay. So a term that transfers the electron from one side to another, right? Let's give it a generic sigma representation, but it has something like this. Right, so this is a quadratic term. So it takes my electron out of site 2, right, and some spin, and it puts it in site 1 and another spin. Okay, so is that good? Is that what we want? Okay, so, so try to okay, try to think about it this way. Okay, what time evolution does is act on the Hamiltonian with terms out of the Hamiltonian, right? You might have a Taylor series of terms out of the Hamiltonian or something like that, but you don't have anything new. You just have products of terms like this. Okay, so if you have something like this, okay, and it acts, say, on this state, then what are you going to get? Okay, so. What you mean is that if you make a superposition, for example, electron will spin up, mm -hmm. electron will spin down, it will never change, really. Just face factor. That, that's uh, no, actually, that's not what I mean. Because you, you can change it, right? So you are, you are allowed to use these quadratic terms to change your phases. And actually, you can do single qubit quantum gates in exactly the way that I did it before. This will work. Okay, but what I would like is to, to do something that, uh, uh, that gives me a superposition of, say, this guy and this guy. Okay, starting from this guy. Okay, and well, what you will find is that, right, this thing is always going to either uh, destroy your state or take you into a state that's outside of the subspace that you want. Okay? So you're not going to be able to generate the dynamics that you want, the qubits that you want, out of terms like this. Okay, in order to generate the dynamics that you want, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, good. So. In order to generate that dynamics, you're going to need terms which look like right, n1 up times uh, some, some operator and the other thing, right? Some d dagger 2 up, d2 down. Okay, so you're going to, hand, to end up needing interactions in order to perform multi-qubit quantum gates. Okay, at least general multi-qubit quantum gates. And if you're not convinced by this, then I suggest you, you take this and you try to play with it because it's very easy. Okay, so take it. It's a finite space of states and just try to do it. Uh, another argument that you should think about here is just preparation. Okay, so 
it's easy to prepare a, to prepare a one electron state. Okay, and in this case you have four of them. But what happens if I go to three qubits? So with three qubits, how many one electron states do I have? This is easy, come on. Six. How many do I need in order to have, right, I have three sites, six one electron states. How many do I need for three qubits? Eight, okay? So the number of one electron states is going to actually increase linearly with the system size. And the number of qubits has to increase exponentially. So it's clear that I can't keep using one electron states. I have to mix up states with more than one electron. And then what, what's going to happen is I'm going to go to, uh, right, I'm going to couple to states where I have multiple electrons on the same site. And this is again outside of my basis. Okay, so no matter how you play with this, okay, it turns out that you just can't use non-interacting physics to generate an interesting quantum computer, which is good because, uh, as we said, we can do everything easily for non-interacting physics. So if you could do this, then uh, you, know, you could build a quantum computer on a classical computer, and there would be uh, you know, some sort of explosion of logic. OK, so, uh, so this is a little bit about you know, trying to link this to quantum information. And I, I think that this is a fun game to play. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice homework for you to try to do it. Uh, but what I want to do now, in the next 20 minutes, is sort of show how we can easily do dynamics in non-interacting uh, physics. Uh, and the concepts of this are going to be uh, something that we can use in actual many-body physics. Okay. So I, I, I sort of did this kind of hand-wavingly, and I did this in a case where I think it's probably obvious to most of you what the dynamics are. But generally, you want to have some sort of numerical tool that's able to do this. And well, again, even if the physics is non-interacting, you know that the Hilbert space is still a many-body Hilbert space. Okay, so you want to have an efficient way never to step outside your classical comfort zone and propagate things. And uh, it turns out that an easy way to do this is to consider uh, properties which are somehow small. Okay, so James showed us correlation functions before. Right, so you can always think about something like this. AIT, AJ dagger, T prime. So these are two time or one particle correlation functions. You can even, uh, right, we also saw these, right, single time correlation functions, right, AJ, or let's, let's do it like this. A dagger I, AJ. Okay, same time correlation function. So these things are something like what's called Green's functions. Uh, this is sometimes called a single particle density matrix. And what's nice about these objects is that the number of objects of this type that you have is always classical. Okay, so even though your Hilbert space is exponentially large, I and J only take on values between 1 and big M, okay? So you have M squared objects like this, okay? And M squared objects like this. Now, of course, you can look at higher order correlation functions and learn more about your system. But typically, uh, you know, in real life, experimentalists cannot measure very high order correlation functions, or at least the number of experiments where they can measure very high order correlation function uh, is, is very small. So we have at least, uh, you know, we, we like these because they're easy to calculate, but we have the excuse that they're also easy to measure. So if we think about uh, science as related to reality and not just abstract mathematics, then these things are the things that we should be looking at anyway. Okay, so there's a small number of them and they're, they're relatively easy to evaluate. So 
what I want to do is derive an equation of motion for this guy. Okay. So how many of you have seen this before? Okay. Few. Okay. So this is quite easy, right? This is really very nice because it takes a few minutes, okay? So what you want to do is write the time derivative of this operator. Okay? What is the time derivative? If I add in, right, okay, I'll do it like this. Okay, my h bar is always 1. So it's 1 over i, the commutator was the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I can insert my uh, Hamiltonian here explicitly. So let's, let's add other indices so we don't get confused. So I'll call them k and m. Okay, let's move this here. And you see that I have to evaluate this commutator. Okay. Now for fermions, we know the anti-commutator. Okay. So we have to use the anti-commutator in order to get this guy. Okay, this is a little exercise in algebra. In this case, actually, the commutator turns out to be the, the same as the anti-commutator. Okay, but what you can show, and you should try to show this yourself, okay, is that this comes out as something like this. I, I, I will give you notes where I do this, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's a little boring to do on the board. Uh, yeah, okay. This is, there's no minus sign here. So this comes out to be something like this. Should have printed this. Okay, or I can sort of write this in a simple way as the commutator between the matrix H and the matrix small sigma, where the matrix small sigma... Ah, okay, no, sorry, I, I skipped a stage here. Okay, so, so in order to do this, okay. At the end of the calculation, I have to take a trace over this whole thing, okay? So again, I, I, I skipped a few stages here, but essentially, uh, right, the calculation that you should try to work out is take the time derivative of these operators, okay, figure out what the commutation relations are, okay, you will get something like this, where here you will have the operator, then take the trace, okay, we define uh, the trace as sigma ij, and then you will get that the time derivative of this classically sized matrix is a commutator of two classically sized matrices. Okay, this is what I'm essentially trying to say here. Okay, so it's really super easy to do the dynamics of this thing. All you have to do is matrix products. Okay. You can, you can take this a little bit further, right? So what you can do is you can solve this equation to give you sigma t equals something like this. Right, so you can get uh, this classical matrix at any later time from the classical matrix at time zero. 
In order to calculate this exponent of the Hamiltonian, you have to diagonalize a classically sized matrix, okay, which again is very easy. Uh, one thing where you should be careful is suppose H is time dependent, you might be tempted to write something like this. Okay, so is this correct? Hmm? Under what circumstances is this correct? If H commutes with itself, it differs. That's right, okay. So this happens if H T, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this becomes exact in that case, and that's actually useful sometimes. You have models where you have this property. If not, then you have something called a Magnus expansion, where you can expand in commutators of the Hamiltonian at different times, okay, which can also be useful sometimes. Okay, so all these things are, uh, you know, slight elaborations on this, but essentially they're all based on the fact that it's super easy to evaluate dynamics of, uh, of non-interacting systems. Okay, uh, what you can do always quite safely, right, is just use the Euler method. Okay, everyone familiar with that? Euler method. Okay, so Euler, which is by far the simplest way to do, right, to solve a differential equation like this is to say, uh, to take your time derivative and do a finite difference, right? And then you can write sigma of t plus delta t equals sigma of t plus i delta t h sigma. Okay, so this is, a, again, a super simple thing to work, uh, to, to do very easy to program. It converges at the limit where delta t is zero and convergence is bad compared to more sophisticated numerical methods, but it's also, right, it's so simple that you can often make delta t small enough and whether you need to do something more, more sophisticated depends on uh, the level of numerics that you're doing. Okay, so okay, so I, I wanted to give you the idea that this is easy uh, but I also wanted to actually show you sort of what it looks like in practice. Here's a very small Python code. I guess I'll spin this around so I can... It does exactly this. Okay, so what do I do? I set some parameters and then I write my Hamiltonian. Okay, so again, this is a nice high-level language. Okay, I have structures for a matrix, and I can just set my uh, elements to be the same as the equation that I wrote earlier on the board. Okay, and you can see that this is essentially a few lines. And then to have some dynamics, I, I need to decide on right, what dynamics do I want, so I set up some initial condition. Be, be concise, so. Ah, is this not visible? Let me see if I can, is this better? or bigger, okay. Okay, so you see I have parameters. Okay, these are the parameters I mentioned in the Hamiltonian before. So you have, you know, a single site energy, a coupling between two sites, the number of sites, the time I want to go to, how many time steps. Then I set my Hamiltonian to be a matrix of zeros of classical size, and I set my elements according to what I said before. And I set some initial condition. In this case, what I do is I uh, occupy even sites. Okay, I put electrons on every even site. Okay, it's a funny initial condition, but it's just so we have some dynamics. 
And now, in order to propagate this, I create that, uh, right, I, I make that initial density matrix, okay, single particle density matrix. And at every time step, I just uh, do exactly, right, this Euler thing that I mentioned to you. So the density matrix, okay, I call this sigma on the board. At time t plus delta t is the previous one. Uh, minus 1j dt times this, okay? So you can probably read this off as the commutator between small h and, uh, and sigma, okay? And then I just uh, evaluate observables which happen to be elements of rho. So if I want to know the populations of the different sites, then these are diagonal elements of my density matrix, okay? So again, how do I interpret this? If i equals j, then this is the probability of occupying site i. If i does not equal j, then this is something like a flux between sites i and j. Okay, and this is all you can get out of this guy. How am I doing? Close it? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so I'll just show you the result of this. Okay, so I plot this. Okay, and you know, I don't know if this is interesting. As I said, I won't talk about physics, but you should certainly be able to see that it's extremely easy. Okay, and each and every one of you can just take this code, which I'll give you, and replace this part with some different Hamiltonian that you're interested in, and see dynamics in the presence of, uh, I don't know, topological insulators or uh, uh, whatever fancy thing you like right now. Okay, and you can do quite a bit with these non-interacting systems. There's a very rich amount of physics. <laughs>